Guys, Kaz, a victory Monday. Yes. After the Giants beat the Eagles uh, for the first time in eight tries. And on that note. <laughs> we haven't had a lot of these. We haven't had a lot of these. So I'm excited. I'm happy to bring in our homie, our good friend, friend of the program, Deal or No Deal, a.k.a. <laughs> Let's Make a Deal, Spin the Wheel, <laughs> my man, David Deal. What's going on, brother? Good morning, Monica. Good morning, Kaz. Happy Victory Monday. And, and I thought you were talking about you, Kaz. Your Jets had a bye. So this is essentially a Victory <laughs> Monday for you. You know what? You know what? Most days, I would be, I'll be upset at this, and I would go back at you. But I'm going to let this rock. I'm going to let this slide. I'm going to let this slide today, all right? All right. It's rare, it's rare we can both celebrate not losing on a Sunday. So there you go. I'll put it like that. Yeah, very we're true. not going to pick at Kaz and his Jets loyalty. Uh, deal. <laughs> Let's just start with the complete performance from the Giants. Total team win over the Eagles. What did you like the most, and what do you hope it carries over moving forward? I think the one thing that you saw in that game yesterday up against the Philadelphia Eagles, all three phases, offense, defense, special teams, were playing in harmony with one another and controlling the game. And watching the entire game yesterday against the Eagles, with the offense coming out fast and sharp in the defense, they put the Eagles coming off of their bye behind the eight ball right away. And in no way in that game throughout the first quarter, second, third, or fourth, did you think that this game was out of the Giants' reach? And that's something that we haven't felt this entire football season. So to see the offense and defense and special teams come together as a whole collective for the first time all this season and to finish a football game on their own terms, it says a lot about the direction that this team's going in. Now, David, I was going to play the lottery tomorrow because <laughs> we went two weeks, two straight weeks, no turnovers by Daniel Jones, Daniel Ten Cents, Daniel Dimes, my guy. Got a lot You're done so with petty. his feet. In the game, what did you see out of Daniel Jones that you liked uh, yesterday afternoon? Well, number one, when they ran that zone read, sweet redemption from making it to the end zone this time and not falling 15, 20 <laughs> yards short. So it was always a good thing. But the thing I saw the most out of Daniel Jones, outside of the first play on the three-step where he held the football too long, you saw him playing yesterday with confidence, with the anticipation. And a lot of that is built off of being able to get plays off of play action and utilization of his legs. So Wayne Gallman stretched the football vertically, running downhill and getting those gritty yards. Daniel Jones was a part of it too. And then in the second half, you saw the adjustments by this Giants offense. You know, a lot of people thought earlier in this game, especially in the first half, that the Giants were playing conservative because they weren't stretching the field vertically in the passing game. But if you saw the way that the Eagles were playing, they're playing too deep bracket coverage, so they weren't going to let anything get over the top. So Daniel Jones took what they gave him, and most importantly, he had successful drives where he got rid of the football, they converted on third down, and he played with confidence and didn't turn the ball over. That's a sign of a quarterback that's learning from his mistakes. Hmm. Yeah, we love we love to see growth. <laughs> we love to celebrate yeah, growth. Yeah. <laughs> um, so specifically, though, schematically deal, uh, Garrett, that RPO, it seems like it's working for Jones. We expect to see more of that. Yeah, it definitely works. And if you remember, not only is it just the RPOs, it's what they build off of it. Remember the little shovel pass that they threw to Evan Ingram? That was built off of a motion by Sterling Shepard. So when you can get moving pieces and you get a defense to have that split-second hesitation instead of reacting, that's where you can come up with big plays, and that's where on the offensive side of the ball you're dictating the tempo of the football game. So a lot of credit, I think, is deserved to not only the Giants' offensive line for the way that they've played up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Washington football team, and now this past game, the Philadelphia Eagles, where the strength of their football team was their defensive line. But Jason Garrett, this is the best this offense has looked through a three-game stretch, and I do believe a lot has to do with the game plan that he's coming in with and the adjustments they're making at halftime. Now, you just mentioned it. That this is the best offensive uh, stretch that they've played in a long time. And, uh, man, I know we jo joked a little bit around about the Giants being the best team in the NFC East, but do you think next week is such an awful time for a bye week considering how good they've been playing and the role that they've been on? Well, obviously, they're on a roll, and a lot of times you sit here and talk about a bye week and you don't want to lose steam or momentum. But I think that this couldn't have come at a perfect time for this Giants football team. 
you know, this bye week is a time where offense, defense, special teams, it's a self-scout week. So you're going to go through offensively, defensively, and special teams. What do we do well? What do we need to make improvements on? And each individual player from their coach is going to receive a sheet of all the individual technique fundamentals that they need to improve in their game to go moving forward and to play this season and to help their football team win games. So I think it's a time to get mentally healthy, physically healthy for a big push because as Joe Judge said in his press conference after, yeah, this is a great win, but I'm paraphrasing, it doesn't guarantee a damn thing in the future. It's about them capitalizing on each and every opportunity. And even though it's a cliche taking one game at a time, that's the only thing this Giants team can do. I like it. I yeah, like what Joe Judge is Shout out to the up. Hog Mollies, too, man. Shout out to the Hog Mollies. They play really well as well. <laughs> that name is so they weird. Did. Did. Listen, I, I was, I was, I was waiting all week to, week to say Hog Mollies again. <laughs> I know, I know. I still don't say Hog Mollies. I still say the old lineman. That's just part of being in it. But, yeah, that, that's one that all fans love to say. It's like, it's all right, like Gio, Jim um, Bob Giants. Jim Bob Cooter, <laughs> best name <laughs> in football. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> Giants and Hog Mollies, we discussed that. Check that off the list. Come on, deal. We got to go around the league now. Kyler Murray and that Let's finish yesterday. The Cardinals knocking off the Bills. Are the Cards, we had to wake up or snooze to this one, are the Cards the most dangerous team in the NFC? You know what? I, I, I don't agree. I would say that they're getting there. But they've got a tough battle in their NFC West just in their division with the Los Angeles Rams. For me, I think it's incredible what the offense has been able to do under Kyler Murray. Obviously, he is absolutely electric when he has the football in his hands, not only running it, but making big plays like the one that he threw, the, the Hail Murray for the touchdown to DeAndre Hopkins. But the reason why I would say that they're not the most dangerous team in the NFC is because of their defense. They got by yesterday with making some key plays and – but I don't really trust where Breaker Patrick and where Patrick Peterson right now are at the cornerback position. So for me, I still think even with Drew Brees right now in limbo, I would say the New Orleans Saints right now are the most dangerous team in the NFC, not only just because of their offensive weapons, but their defense is coming together, they're healthy, and they're playing better than ever. And also, you got to love Jameis Winston's hips, all right? I love the, I love the pregame uh, <laughs> shimmy every single time. Um, man, like let's, let's talk about your, your, your boy. <laughs> Yo, so your boy, your boy Tom Brady had a pretty big bounce back game yesterday against the Carolina Panthers. Antonio Brown got into the mix. What are your thoughts? I know we're talking about the NFC right now, but obviously we want to know uh, what you think about the, the Buccaneers and Brady and uh, getting back off the schneid after getting just pummeled by the, your, the aforementioned New Orleans Saints last week. Yeah, this is a big bounce back win for them. Obviously, we know that they were stuck with plane problems on a tarmac for five hours, but this was a division game that they had to win. Even when you're looking at the Carolina Panthers, you knew that they were going to give the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a test, especially on the defensive side of the ball and the offensive side of the ball. When Joe Brady, their offensive coordinator, came from New Orleans. So if there was a game that you could watch and get something before the game, it was his previous team to get ready for this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. But I think they went back to the bread and butter. Everybody loves Antonio Brown and what he can bring to this offense. But this offense is at its best when they're running the football downhill and Tom Brady is building everything off of play action where they're using their two tight ends. So as much as it was exciting to see Antonio Brown showing up in their lineup, I don't think that's going to be the key for them winning football games. I think Ronald Jones, uh, uh, Leonard Fournette, letting this offensive line pick up, one and two tight end systems, that's what opens up everything for the deep passing game for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All right, Dio, we got a new segment we're putting you through. Coach him up, not a segment, but a question with a cute name. Coach okay. him up. <laughs> you mentioned in both of the two previous questions the New Orleans Saints. There is a big question mark, at least until this afternoon, when we get MRI results on Drew Brees, who took that shot to the ribs. If Brees is not available, how would you coach the Saints? Are you putting in Taysom Hill or Jameis Winston, or is it a combination? I'd go 50-50, just like what happened when I went with Teddy Bridgewater and Taysom Hill. The reason why I say that is, when he saw Jameis Winston come in yesterday, he was a game manager. 
short, intermediate passes. Don't be risky with the football. You saw a lot of in outbreaking routes towards the sidelines. Just get the football out of your hands and don't lose the game. And when you do that with him and then you have a player and a quarterback like Taysom Hill, he comes in with a completely different package for the offense, a completely different personnel group. So when you can keep a defense guessing based upon having a two-quarterback rotation, that's exactly where you want to be as an offense. And we know uh, Sean Payton, the head coach, has been able to do that successfully. So I would stick with the 50-50 because of the, when you do that, you're putting a defense on its heels not knowing what's coming.